I'd like to welcome you to our 938 podcast again this week. I hope you've been watching our previous ones. We've had a lot of different podcasts on various subjects about missions around the world, the mission office, the new building project that we have going on, and interviewing a lot of different missionaries. We have just finished our national fellowship meeting with pastors and missionaries coming into Springfield, Missouri. And one of the things that we do is have a missions morning where we show a lot of different videos and we have new missionaries approved, as well as showing a trailer for our new documentary. Now with the Project 938, we've uh, produced several documentaries, one on Marjorie Browning, missionary in uh, Brazil, uh, former missionary in Brazil, and then Laverne Rogers, who is a missionary in Japan for 72 years. And we are producing a new one this year. And so we showed the trailer of the family that we are doing the documentary of, and that's my parents, Richard and Janine Connerup. And so we want to talk a little bit about that uh, documentary today. And to do that and to help me, I have my brother, Oli Connerup, with us today. So Oli, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Good to be here. And, uh, Last time we did a podcast, you were in Kenya, and we did it uh, remotely. That's right. I and so that. Mm-hmm. it was neat to talk about the ministry there. Uh, this time, we're going to talk about our parents. Okay. And uh, I think the other day, you were telling me that you've lived in Africa for quite a few years. Uh, how many years is that? Well, if you include the time that I was with uh, our parents in Ethiopia, it'd be over 50 years. Wow. 50 years in Africa. So I would probably say that's like home to you. Yes, I would say so. More than here in America. Right. Uh, now, since you were there with our parents when they first went, um, they after they went to a language school and did some things, they, they went up into the countryside to Roby and lived in a tent for two years. So you must have lived in that tent some as well. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, of course, we had to go to boarding school, and then whenever we'd have the off time, uh, we had come home, and uh, of course, Dad was uh, and Mom lived in a tent because Dad was building homes for missionaries, and uh, so we thought this was ne- neat. It was like camping out. Right. I remember the uh, the tent didn't have a floor in it, and so whenever it rained, and then it, the place uh, flooded and it was muddy, and we'd get out of the <laughs> cot in the morning. But us boys thought that was great. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Mom probably didn't think it was no, great. she didn't think so. <laughs> uh, probably when it dried, did you have, like, grass that even grew there later? and be like carpet, maybe? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wish. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's neat. So you got to live in that tent. And then uh, a few years after that, they moved further into the countryside to near a town called Kambolcha and to a village. Um, tell me a little bit about that. Well, uh yeah, of course, Dad was building a house for our family. And uh, first of all, we lived in a, a tent house on stilts, and it was just a three-room. And then later, uh, Dad was able to build a permanent house for us. Yeah, that's neat. So it was kind of in a, in a valley between some mountain ranges, mountains that we moved into. And a lot of the people there hadn't even seen, especially people from America. Yeah, yeah, they hadn't seen white people, that's for sure. Yeah. So that's neat. So they were able to go into that region of Ethiopia and start a church and a ministry that um, is, is, is even still going today. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. yeah. So um, tell me about boarding school a little bit. Well, uh, even back in those days, uh, there weren't even any homeschool curriculum. So uh, uh, missionaries didn't have a choice. And of course, uh, when I was eight years of age was the first time that uh, I went to boarding school. And it wasn't easy uh, for any of us, Mm -hmm. but um, I just felt that, well, this is what God had uh, my parents uh, needed to do in order for them to do their ministry. And so I put up with it, and many people uh, thought that I liked it. Well, I don't know that I liked it all that much, but anyway, I put up with it. Mm -hmm. Well, and talking about uh, schooling, they they didn't have a lot of the homeschooling like we have today. Of course, there was nothing on the internet because there was no internet. Um, but also, uh, our sister Jackie, she's a year older than you. Right. She would have been, when I was in first grade, she was in 11th grade, you were in 10th grade, Eric was in 5th grade. And so, for mom to teach people, at all of us at home, 
uh, living remotely would not have been easy. Right. So we went to boarding school. Right. In fact, I went in first grade to Bingham Academy. Right. And uh, I saw mom and dad uh, once every three months. And, right. you know, it wasn't easy um, at first, but the other kids were in the same situation. We had to encourage each other. And uh, we did fine, but it was, I think, mostly hard on mom. Well, there's a lot of things I didn't like about boarding school, but one thing I did like, or later, I didn't at the time, but that's uh, when we had to memorize verses before uh, uh, breakfast. Yes. And uh, if we said all of our verses through the year, then we'd go to the best place in town uh, to eat, and we thought that was neat. Of course, I never thought I'd be a preacher, missionary, in the future, but now those verses, I can just review them and they come back to me pretty quickly. Yeah, yeah, I remember that too. We'd get up early, mm -hmm. go learn our verses, and then go to breakfast right. after that, and then to school. So, neat experiences. So, as we're putting this documentary together, there's a lot of this that we're talking about that'll be in the documentary. One of the neat things about this documentary is we have uh, footage on eight millimeter movies right. that Dad took. Right. And Dad was he was had an interest in photography back in those days. Yeah, he did. Uh, in fact, he had several things that uh, uh, he enjoyed doing, and one uh, one was uh, uh, d uh, doing medical uh, help for people in the area. And of course, having been a uh, a fireman in the fire department in Denver, um, he knew first aid. And uh, that was basically what he went by. But uh, I remember he just used uh, salve and Epsom salts and just about anything he uh, did uh, cured whatever the people needed. And we, we really began to realize that those people just had a lot of faith in, in what uh, our dad was doing. Yeah. And it was amazing how quickly they healed. Yeah, it's true. I remember in the mornings coming out of the house and there'd be five, six, seven, eight people <laughs> Right. lined up every morning to come right. see them. Mm -hmm. They had different burns or things right. like that. And mm -hmm. and uh, that was a, a neat outreach, really, that he right. had to be able to then share the gospel and, right. and all that. So uh, so that was in Ethiopia, and then uh, communism came in. Um, I was in junior high. I remember when we would be in Addis, the riots and the university students, you know, the government, some of the people would be leading them to cause problems and protests and and uh, a lot of things like that were kind of scary, but uh, Dad uh, went through some hard times. Yeah, he really did. Yeah, that's in your book. A yes. Lot of that. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Find out more information about that. Read my book, um, uh, from Alcatraz to Africa. And uh, you might say, well, what's Alcatraz got to do with that? Well, you got to get the book, right. and and you can find out. But uh, they went through some very difficult times with that communism. Dad was able to finally leave. He had been accused of treason, mm -hmm. and uh, but it was able to leave. Then went to Kenya as missionaries. Now you have served in Kenya for many years. How did you become interested in being a missionary and even in Kenya? Well, when I was at uh, in college here at uh, BBC in Springfield, Missouri, um, I I just knew God called me to preach, but I didn't know in what area, and uh, so I took the missions course, being a missionary kid. And, uh, and then I figured if God called me to be a missionary, then yeah, I'd, have, had, I'd finished that course. Mm -hmm. So um, I, um, one year was, uh, I think mom came back and uh, on a medical leave and she uh, exp uh, told me that uh, the friend of mine named Ababa wanted something from America. Well, I, I thought, what could that be? That could be an airplane, uh, a big house, whatever. Right. And uh, she said, no, what he wants from you is a letter. And I thought, well, he can't read, and I couldn't write his letter uh, uh, his, in his language if I wanted to. Mm -hmm. So uh, I thought, well, maybe he's just showing his love uh, that we had for each other mm -hmm. and had never been saved in the 12 years he worked on the mission station. Mm -hmm. I thought, well, maybe I'll just go there and, and lead Ababa to Christ. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, I got to thinking, no, I don't think God would call me to do just lead one man to Christ. But then I remember about Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought, well, let me go in that direction. And so that was my plan. And then communism took over the country, and the missionaries could not uh, be there. And I had to I'd think, what else uh, uh, could I do? And then I realized you, you can take the gospel anywhere. Yeah. And so I'll just go in that area. And I, I found out that Kenya was open to missionaries. And so 
uh, decided to go to Kenya. Yeah. And now you've been there 43 years. Right. Mm -hmm. And when you first went there, you started working with dad. Mom and dad had gone to Kenya after they had to leave yeah, Ethiopia. Ar around the same time uh, that we made that decision, uh, we heard that mom and dad were making that decision. I thought, well, that's good for us. Mm -hmm. And so the first year that we got there, uh, they were already there because they already had support. And uh, I was able to uh, uh, glean from dad uh, th that first year after language school. And uh, then the next year, uh, when they went on furlough, I thought, now it's time for me to stand on my own feet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. Good. So um, dad, dad became really good with working with government offices and going and talking to some of these government leaders and getting land and things like that. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, back in those days, uh, the president wanted people to develop his country, and so he was, uh, would give out uh, land to whoever would develop it, particularly churches. Mm -hmm. And uh, so with that in mind, uh, Dad knew, wow, we can get uh, land and pay nothing for it and be able to build churches on it. So he began to do that, and he was really good at it, of course, uh, getting to know the secretaries and bringing flowers and Bibles and different mm -hmm. things like this to get into these government officials. Yeah. But, yeah, I learned a lot from him uh, on how to do that. And mm -hmm. so it helped me even in my ministry. Yeah. There was one man I remember going in with him when I was a missionary into these offices as he was showing me where to go and how to do it and how, do you, how you speak to him, but a man by the name of Chasina. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, dad talked to him and said, hey, can you show me which way the city of Nairobi is going to be growing in the future? Right. And reluctantly, Chasina did, but he showed him. And so dad was able to see that and then get some land all the way up that Thika Road is where the city was, one of the ways it was going to be growing. Well, it's really, it's really happened that way, too. And we're glad that uh, dad did that because we have churches in these areas that apartments are growing up all over the, all around their churches and so on so it's been a big help i remember one time when uh, uh dad said for a year every week he was uh, uh trying to get uh, land in a particular area and finally one one time he was there at seven thirty in the morning and the uh the district commissioner came uh, walking in greeted him went in his office and his door was left open a little bit and he told his secretary he said he said, just give that man whatever he wants. I'm tired of him being here. Yeah. <laughs> That's neat. Mm -hmm. uh, what about the church in Ruiru? Uh, he was able to get that a piece of land, and then the land commissioner told him about the property next to that. Oh, yeah. Then uh, Chesina uh, called him into his office one time, which no one ever does that, mm -hmm. and, uh, but they became, they'd become friends. Mm -hmm. And uh, he told uh, uh, our dad that, hey, there's land next to your church. We're going to give it to another church. He said, but I'm thinking that you probably don't want that. And uh, so would you like to have it? And my dad said, well, I don't know what I'd do with it. He said, well, I'm sure you can think of something. Mm -hmm. So dad said, uh, okay, Bible college. Well, praise the Lord. Uh, we do have a Bible college there today. And uh, we just had our 30th anniversary, and of course we had you there yes. uh, to speak for uh, our anniversary and the charge to our 10 students that got their Bachelor of Arts degrees that time. Wow, that's neat. Yeah, so Dad w learned to work with the government leaders. He um, was able to even to go and get some work permits for missionaries. Mm -hmm. I think he enjoyed some of that kind of thing, actually, oh, yeah. that most right. people don't. Right. But I remember he was able to get some uh, work permits for missionaries in the day when he was there in 10 minutes. Yeah. And uh, that's unheard of. Right. Yeah. And even today, it's not that easy. Right. No. And so he did a lot of that besides church planning, but he also spent a lot of time training leaders. He understood right. the importance of, of training them so that they could then be uh, ministers to their own people. Well, that was his vision, and, and that's what happened with the Bible College and today. Uh, over 90 uh, students uh, have gone out, and, and most of them today are pastoring churches today. And, yes. and when we think about that, wow, we probably wouldn't have that today if it wasn't for the Bible college. Right, yeah. In fact, even back in Ethiopia, he understood training leaders so oh, that yeah. whenever the difficult times would come, they could continue on. Right, yeah, and, and that's what happened. Yeah. And so I, through the efforts of our missionaries and now national pastors and leaders in Kenya, there's 
Uh, how many churches uh, roughly in Kenya? Well, I remember when we, I first got there and I, I looked around and talked with missionaries and came up with maybe a hundred uh, churches. Well, nowadays there's over a thousand. Uh, we do have a directory of 750 wow. that we've identified that uh, with uh, the names and the names of the pastors and their contacts. Yes. And of course, this is a help for our uh, missionaries and future Kenyan missionaries that they'll be able to know who to go in contact to raise their support. Mm -hmm. That's neat. You know, we've, we are uh, putting this documentary together and it's still in process at this point. Uh, one of the neat things we've been able to do is uh, invite one of our early missionaries from Ethiopia, Lonnie Brooks, mm -hmm. uh, to come, and he is he's doing the narration. And it's just neat to think that another early missionary that was there right after Dad and Mom got there uh, to be able to do the narration. Right, I great. think you talked to him about that the other day. Oh, yeah. I talked to him about that, but one other thing I talked to him about was uh, that he was my lone scoutmaster. Okay. Uh, Boy Scout um, uh, master. And uh, yet uh, we never did anything because we tried to get uh, material for that. And the Boy Scouts at that time said, well, we don't have a, a, a foreign curriculum mm -hmm. uh, or for foreigners. And we kept telling them, I'm not a foreigner. I'm yeah. American, but I'm in a foreign country. Right. And we never did, but we still joke about that today. Okay. Yeah, that's neat. Well, we have a lot of good uh, family, really, when you think about all those missionaries that right. were there in Ethiopia. Those were some tough days, mm -hmm. uh, tough times. Then some of them even went to Kenya when they all had to leave Ethiopia. Right. We were able to minister together mm -hmm. there. Right. So uh, you said to me before that Dad was like a mentor to you and, and, and taught you some things about culture and things like that. Oh, yeah. Explain that. Well, when I first got to Kenya, I was very dog dogmatic and many different things. And uh, he would uh, tell me, well, things are not just always the way you think they ought to be, and so on, and uh, tempered me a lot, and that was a big help to me. Uh, but he's been my mentor even up to this, this time. And if nothing else, uh, whenever we get together, all we do is talk about the ministry. And I was just over at his house the other day and sharing him with things that are going on, and he was excited about hearing that things are doing great uh, there in Kenya. Yeah. You told me the story once when uh, you're walking down the, the city, Nairobi streets, and he was walking fast, and you're wondering, why is he doing that? Oh, yeah. Well, uh, not only did he tell me or help me with a lot of things to do with the ministry, but just even with the culture, um, I was, uh, uh, walk, whenever I'd walk with him in town, he'd be walking really quickly, and I was thinking, why is he walking so fast? Yeah. Well, one time I was walking, just walking along, and then I realized he wasn't with me, and I turned around and looked, and he had someone bent over a car telling him, don't, don't ever put your hand in my pocket again. And I'm thinking, <laughs> oh, that's what he's talking about. Yeah. So he was going quickly so that people wouldn't steal his watch or right. steal from his pocket. Wow, and so on. Yeah. that's funny. Um, you worked in Nakuru for a while. You were, it was another city that you went to and started a church and all that. And the president of Kenya attended your church on a number of occasions. Right. Well, we did. Uh, from learning from Dad how to get land, we were able to get land on a, a major road and uh, five acres of land. And uh, uh, But there are so many people that kept coming and saying, this land doesn't belong to you, it belongs to somebody else. And I thought, my, if I could just get the president to come to our church, yeah. then people would leave us alone. Mm -hmm. Well, one day the president was passing by on his way to his, his personal home, and he stopped on the road. Well, I was outside on, in the church compound, and I thought, maybe he wants to talk to us because nobody was on the other side of the road. Yeah. And so I went over there. By the time I got to uh, his vehicle, I mean, there was a crowd of people. The guards had gotten out, and they had stopped us from getting close to him and so on. But he kept calling for me, and so I told the guard, uh, His Excellency is calling for me. So he looked at, at the president, and he realized he was calling for me, and so I went up to the... Uh, I was allowed to go and talk to him, and uh, the president asked me, how come you're not building? I said, well, we've been taken to court. He said, he looked at his driver, he said, how can a church be taken to court? <laughs> and he goes, who's doing this? Well, I had a list of about 10 different government offices that were mm -hmm. giving me problems, and I, I just told him the neighbor, the Ministry of Livestock and Development, 
And uh, he said, well, let me take care of this. And I said, appreciate it. And then I, I guess I stepped out by faith and said to him, well, we'd like you to come to our dedication service. We're planning on dedicating our church building here in August. Yeah. And he said, I'll see what I can do. Well, praise the Lord, he did come. And, uh, and we had a great service and, and so on. And for the next two years, he came 10 times. Mm-hmm. So wow. that really worked out great. That's neat. Yeah. That's neat. Uh, we could go on and on all day talking mm-hmm. stories and memories and things like that. And, uh, but we're, we're lo- thinking about this documentary that's coming out. And there's some stories that we haven't said that are going to be in that documentary. Right. Things that were pretty neat about how people came to know the Lord, but also just some of the difficulties and things that mom and dad went through right. um, that I think will be a, a great challenge to people. And hopefully we'll encourage people to be missionaries. Right. So I want to thank you for joining us today as we talked about the uh, documentary, the 938 documentary, part of a docu-series that we're putting together, and uh, of our parents, Richard and Janine Conrup. And I sure hope that you will uh, be watching for it. For in- more information about it, you can go to our website, uh, project938.world. And there you'll be able to find all kinds of resources for uh, using the Project 938 in your church. There's videos from pastors, from national pastors, from missionaries. There's all kinds of graphics and things you can use to help promoting the 938 challenge. What is that challenge? We're challenging people to pray at 938 in the morning or 938 at night, patterned after Matthew chapter 9, verse 38, where Jesus said, Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth labors into his harvest. That's what we need because the world is in desperate need of the gospel. They need Jesus Christ. And we have that story. We have uh, that gift of salvation to tell people about. And so we hope that you'll go to that website, check it out, and then be waiting for this documentary that's going to be coming. It'll be available in September. And we hope you'll show it to your churches, watch it yourself, uh, share it with your family members. So thank you for joining us in this episode of the 938 podcast. God bless you.